It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to Queer Romance in Bollywood, conversations about ek larki ko dekha to aisa laga. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! <laughs> um, before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge where tonight's event is taking place. We, we're on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to support First Nations, Inuit, and Metis communities by showing the works of Indigenous filmmakers here at TIFF. For instance, we are currently showing Nipa Wista, Maso Win, We Will Stand Up, director and educator Tasha Hubbard's personal reflection on the death of young Cree man Colton Bushy and the trial and acquittal of the man who shot him. We hope that you can join us to see this remarkable film on the big screen. I am so excited, I'm trembling, <laughs> to be presenting tonight's event. Um, the most amazing things really start from just a conversation. Um, and that's actually, I wanted to share with you how this event came about. Um, my sisters at Didihood, which is an incredible organization, um, and I, we, we started to talk about this film, Eklarkiko de Kato Esalaga, um, earlier this year. Uh, we knew we had to make sure we used this film's big Bollywood platform, as we all know, to shed light on the many points touched uh, in the film around diversity, inclusion, acceptance, and most of all, the right to love who you choose to love with, with complete freedom and safety, which is a basic human right. Right? I brought the idea to program the film to the incredible TIFF team. And uh, they actually came back to me and said, why don't we actually screen and curate this film uh, during Pride Month in Toronto, which honestly is a dream come true. So thank you, Keith, Amanda, and Christoph. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> incredible TIFF team. Um, we all know the times we are living in more so than ever right now, which is why it is crucial for us to make these events happen more often at accessible buildings like the TIFF Bell Lightbox. My main goal as a programmer through this event and others is to continue to create safe spaces for the most vulnerable communities amongst us, and you are all doing the same by being here tonight, so thank you. Um, I really think being an ally doesn't take much. Um, sometimes just showing up can sometimes really be enough. Uh, so thank you for showing up tonight and happy Pride. <laughs> Before I kick off the screening, a reminder that uh, we hope you'll stick around uh, after the screening as members of, our, uh, of the South Asian community, um, LGBTQ community, join us for a round table conversation about uh, inclusivity and representation in mainstream Bollywood. Uh, tonight's moderator is Indu Vashist, uh, and panelists are Amita Handa, Burka Gupta, and Aditya Agarwal. We'll be back to talk to them soon. Yes, woo! <laughs> um, just to start off, I wanted to give a little bit of context for this film, for those of you don't, that aren't aware. So this is the first um, mainstream Hindi language film that's come out since um, the writing down of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. Um, Section 377 was the law that governed, um, well, that criminalized same-sex activity, particularly sodomy. Um, there has been um, decades-long battle to write down this code. So um, I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that this is the first um, film that's come out since then. Um, this film comes in a long line of artistic production that has been um, pedagogical in nature, um, challenging um, attitudes uh, towards homosexuality in India. And um, we've seen many films come and go in, in recent times. Um, this one, I think, is special because it's not only the one, the first one since decriminalization, but I think it shows a very different story than what we've seen prior to. Um, I just wanted to also talk about um, the local connection with the decriminalization story, which is really important. So Toronto, as we know, is home to um, a very diverse population. Um, in the early 90s, there was a festival called Desh Pradesh. Uh, in the submissions to the Supreme Court, 
uh, with timelines um, that actually look at queer organizing, Desi queer organizing across the world, we always began with Desh Pradesh. Um, so that was a submission within within the high court and then the Supreme Court where um, the, the law was finally written down. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all the queers who have been organizing in Toronto for decades. So I'm just going to jump right into the question. So this, this question is for everyone. Um, how did you feel the first time you saw the trailer or the film for, um, for the, the entirety of the film? I know for me, um, when I first saw the trailer, I was like, is, I'm pretty sure this is gay, but there's no hints <laughs> in the trailer. Well, there's, there's hints enough, but um, there, you know, it, there was, it was a bit of a teaser. And when I finally saw it in the cinema, there was a loud gasp, even though we were with a whole bunch of queers, like from everybody else around us, there was a gasp when she finally says, you know, that she, she loves a woman. So I just wanted to know how you felt watching this film and, or, or the trailer. Um. The first time I saw the film, um, I experienced, uh, it was a similar experience where people around me were gasping. Uh, it's like the moment of disclosure when, you know, queerness becomes exposed. Um, I think like, for me, it was really emotional to see the flashbacks, the childhood sequences, um, you know, the sepia filter and all of that. Like, it's very like, um, you know, in many ways, it's very like, you know, even campy, but, you know, I, I just, you know, it's so gut wrenching to get those shots of the diary to like watch the father actually engage with the materials that his daughter has been like keeping away from him all of these years. Um, yeah. And just to see so much joy, so much laughter, um, in this, um, in this film, right. It's, um, so that was quite eye opening. Um, I feel like the first time I saw the trailer, it was more that the, I saw the hype of the trailer, even before I saw the trailer, because queer blogging everywhere was like, oh my God, queer Bollywood film is coming out. And I was like, I must find this trailer. Because, you know, I grew up on Bollywood. And I grew up on watching all of the cheesy films from the 90s that I look back at, and I'm like, what was I watching? Um, and so watching this trailer, I was obviously excited, as much as I was like, this is going to disappoint me, probably. But I was excited. I was really excited and didn't see the film in the early week. I think I saw it two weeks in. So by then the audiences had died down a little bit and people knew what to expect from the film. So I don't think I experienced that gasp in the audience. Um, but I will say the first time I saw it, I saw it with five to six queer South Asians and we were disappointed, I won't lie. Um, and part of it is I just want to see more of Kuhu because she's gorgeous. Um, and, and as a queer, I was like, I want to see more queer romance, right? And so the first time I will say I was a bit disappointed with it, I was like, oh, this is made for straight people, I get it. And I actually was more emotional tonight than I was the first night I saw it. Um, yeah, I would say I, I missed the trailer, so I, I never saw the trailer. And I actually saw the film in two parts, so I saw the first half. Uh, and I, and I, I also felt disappointed by it because... I felt it was very surface. Um, the second half I actually thought was better, um, but I think in in some ways, I guess it's not, it wasn't really a love story, right? It's more a coming out story. It's more about um, like homophobia in our community um, and not so much the relationship between the two women wasn't very uh, developed or nuanced. Um, and I think in many ways purposefully so because it was, definitely uh, targeted towards a mainstream audience. Um, so yeah, I think I, I did feel that disappointment too because I felt it was very surfacey. The second half though, I have to agree with what you were saying at the end in terms of like, for me, the, the strongest character in a way was the father because um, he's kind of like the father maybe every queer person wants to have eventually, right? Because he, he, he in the end, he's sort of, we're taught from such a young age that what matters the most is like what people think of you, what people think of you, and what the community thinks. And I think, uh, in the end, he's sort of saying, "No, I'll I'll do whatever it takes, you know, to to make you happy." So I think uh, in that way, and and some of the 
references to the to the loneliness, to the homophobia, to the the silencing, the diary. I thought those were also powerful. Great, thank you. Um, what would this film have done for you if you had had it at a different age? You want me to start? We can't just always look at you. <laughs> um, I think, um, I mean, just going off of what you said, Amita, like, like seeing a patriarch, um, you know, like just just seeing this portrayal um, of this character, um, Balbir, Baljeet, Balbir, <laughs> one of the two, um, is. Um, would have changed a lot for me, you know, like just watching it um, when I was young. I mean, like the conflict with the father is such a pivotal thing to melodrama as a genre, um, especially historically in mainstream Indian film, where the patriarch kind of holds the strings to, uh, you know, where the narrative is going to go, right? What What's going to happen after the conflict? Where are the threats going to meet, um, you know, when will characters' motivations be fulfilled? Who is transgressive, who is not? The father figure is kind of a determinant of that. Um, and I think thinking about that in the context of the melodrama and how this film really like exploits the grammar of the melodrama, um, but like turns it on its head in some ways, uh, without you realizing it, it's very much, you know, um, breezy, lighthearted, uh, even conventional in many ways. Uh, but just seeing, you know, when you're caught off guard, when you're kind of enjoying uh, yourself, when you're like mid laughter, you know, you kind of catch yourself um, feeling for this man and feeling for his daughter. And that in itself is such a powerful thing because, um, yeah, I'm just wondering what, um, you know, young people, as so many young people in the audience in the film uh, who are watching the play, um, how powerful, but also wordless, um, unspeakable, it can feel. Um, yeah, so I think definitely the, yeah, like thinking about girlhood as well. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what it would have meant, to be honest. I didn't realize my queerness till my 20s. So like, to be blunt, I already had a long time experience with my father letting me down, right? Like in terms of what it meant to be a girl and what it meant to deal with the patriarchy, right? So I don't know if at that time I would have felt like, oh, I'm gonna show this to my dad and then things will be different, to be, to be completely honest, right? I think representation matters. So I do believe that being able to see this film and be able to see a representation of Bollywood that in some way could have constructed a different hope or reality would have been very meaningful. And it would have been nice to be able to be like, hey, there's this queer Bollywood film, let's all watch it together. Or there's this one character that's less problematic this time, let's watch that one instead. So I think that would have been really impactful. I, I don't know, I, I, like it's interesting because I, I actually saw my father in the Anil Kapoor character, like I could see, because my father was very much this kind of person who, who wanted to love his child. So I definitely identified with that and, um, and, and that struggle. Um, I don't know if it would be a film that would have been vindicating and helpful or if it would have caused more um, tension and more, um, I don't know. But I think in some ways what you were saying, Burka, in terms of uh, having a mainstream Bollywood representation um, that because it, so my parents were complete Bollywood junkies. They used to like when the VCR came out, they would be watching like three Bollywood films back to back, nine hours of just sitting there. So I think that in some ways that yeah, then there's like some reference point, some mainstream reference point that they can enter to maybe try to um, get some kind of connection. Yeah. Yeah, and if I can add to that, I guess like my relationship with my father is great now. By the way, it's a long progress. <laughs> It's always a work in progress, I feel. Um, what I'll say is like, I, as also someone who grew up watching Bollywood all the time, like every story is about a climax. It's about an interracial, it's about things. And I can say that from experience, watching Bollywood films didn't necessarily mean that I felt like in the home space, those were values then got in incorporated. Like it was like, those are those people, those are the filmy people, this is not what we do. 
So I feel like when it comes to the film, it but it meant a lot for me, but I don't think it would have necessarily changed anything in the conversation for me at home. I mean, for me, I I think that this film actually would have been quite impactful. I was I grew up in the Moga of Canada, which is like a small Punjabi village in which this like I wrote I actually wrote a piece uh, many years ago called um, Confessions of a Brown Skin Redneck, mm -hmm. um, which actually very much um, goes along the same kind of storyline and feeling of that feeling of aloneness. And for me, like I felt growing up here that being queer was like meaning that you had to be white right and like so for me to see any kind of brown representation and anyone actually grappling with a family I think would have been very impactful um and I, I mean I don't know what it's like in this context in the here and now for this film to come out in the diaspora but like at that time it would have been quite useful I think and it's interesting I just came back from visiting my family and my mom watched the film not because she knew it was queer but because of the title. Um, and she was like, I was, and so I asked her, I said, well, how did that feel for you? And she said, I think it's very educational. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because it does replace the caste drama or the Muslim Hindu drama with, uh, with like a same sex kind of a story using that trope, I think like Aditya said has been like, I, it's such a smart move. Yeah. You know, and in, I, I'm so curious to see how film is going to develop because we're st still in early days. Like we've been, we've been not criminals for only on less than less than a less than a year. Um, so um, I'm sorry, yeah. sorry to inter interrupt, but I'm um, um, I was really drawn to y your observation of how she comes out in a gurdwara, and like her, like hers. Sikh girlhood is very much a gay girlhood mm -hmm. um, and like her lesbianism is very spiritual like it's very much like a faith meets sexuality um, even spatially speaking mm -hmm. I don't know I was just wondering if um, you wanted to sure talk about Aditya, that Aditya is referring to something I wrote uh, after watching the film um, and dealing with like fundamentalism within our community and a fundamentalism that really brushes away all kinds of um, different kinds of experiences. And um, for me, you know, all of the, the, you know, the romance scene is probably two minutes long, but it's, it's like a montage, but I could relate to every single scene, you know, going and romancing, um, in the like Hoskos. the ruins, yeah, in Hoskos village and in in the madras like the ru uh, ruins of the madrasa. I, just the, as a background, I uh, was queer in a small town, and I had a very difficult time with my family. And I decided to go to India and join the queer movement there, and was very much a part of the queer movement there um, after the 2010 uh, Delhi High Court decision. And so, um, and that was me trying to talk back to my community and be like, there are brown queers because I didn't have access to that before. Um, and so for me, what was interesting in terms of the spaces in which romance happened was they were all religious spaces, whether it was the ruins of the madrasa or whether it was in the Gurdwara, those spaces were spaces that you could carve out because they're public spaces and you can't really meet in private. And so finding those like public spaces that are crowded and where you can go unnoticed was really a beautiful thing. And to, to see how you, you're unnoticed, but you're also noticed and you're protected because, you know, those are the spaces in which like violence is less likely to happen or at least specific kinds of violence is less likely to happen so for me like yeah the the way in which the setting um in which the the conversations happened were very very important and i think really indicative of how people lived under the radar for so long yeah. like so many of these spaces of, of faith and even even like the wedding sequences they're like women's spaces, mm -hmm. gendered, like feminized kind of spaces. And, you know, like so much of female desire, it seems like in the film seems to direct that it seems to like encourage it almost homosociality in some ways. Um, but yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my next question is actually for Aditya. Um, you're a film programmer. Um, in recent years, there's been a lot of progressive representations in um, the Hindi language cinema. I hate the term Bollywood. I'm trying not to use it. Um, and uh, with the advent of 
television, um, like the streaming services television, um, I'm thinking of like different representations like Margarita with a Straw or Kapoor and Sons or Angry Indian Goddesses, Aligarh, um, Sacred Games, Made in Heaven. We, we are seeing a shift and now post decriminalization, I'm trying, uh, I'd like to ask you what you, how do you imagine that queer representation in Indian cinema will change? Um, that's a big question and I've been thinking about it. Um, I feel like, you know, after having seen Ek Lerki Ko Dekha To Aisa Laga for the third time, um, it's, I mean, I'm thinking about the ways in which form and like cinematic form in particular can like inhabit, um, you know, gay romances, like lesbian love stories. What does it mean to have a big funded, like high budget studio project with mainstream actors actually green lighting a project like this? Um, I mean, there are so many possibilities. I'm sure there's a lot of great work happening. Um, you know, Ghazal Daliwal, the Punjabi trans woman who's written this film is, you know, doing more writing and there seems to be, you know, incredible writers and, you know, content creators. Um, but I'm particularly drawn to how, like, films that don't really carry markings of queerness can still be read as queer. And I think a lot of what the diaspora has done is it's crafted queerness out of mainstream, very, like, male gazy representations um, of women, of, like, female intimacies. You know, like, I'm even thinking about, um, I think it was in an, in an interview with you, Amita, where when you were talk, where there was like a reference to a lot of the soundtrack, um, the Choli Ke Piche Kya Hai, um, you know, and which translates directly to um, what's behind uh, the blouse. blouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was like, it, it was a very like raunchy number, right? Made for male consumption. Uh, but the way in which a lot of the diaspora has ad adopted, you know, such cultural products is to queer them. Um, but perhaps, you know, there are films that are, you know, very much outspoken about their queer narrative. But in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about how films that aren't ostensibly queer can, you know, still kind of um, carry that, you know. And I feel like in many ways, this can be one of them. You know, it's, it's a story about a family. It's um, a romantic comedy drama. Um, you know, going into it, it can be so many things, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And also, I think I'm particularly interested in the ways in which, you know, politics um, is intersecting with um, kind of like queer liberation, if you will. Um, yeah, and 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 just to see, just to like witness this subplot or this like tongue in cheek kind of narrative subplot of you know this Muslim man who is a, feels smitten by this woman and he wants to pursue her and then he's rejected. You know, we are watching this in and then but then he he's the one who ends up like you know fueling the narrative and really you know um, pursuing uh, this her love story. Um, and we are living in a time where you know Muslims. And Dalit people are being persecuted in India um, because of um, uh, because of our state and non-state actors. You know, it's a Hindu fascist uh, right-wing government right now. So just to see this film, which is so innocent, so sincere, you know, it's almost reminiscent of like a '70s kind of like um, you know unself-conscious um, kind of um, um, drama, right? Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry, I spoke a lot. Anyone else want to speak to the question of? the trajectory of queer film in Hindi language or uh, regional language cinema? I think the only thing I'd add Ed, to, like you've said so many great things, uh, it is the piece that like, it's, it's great to be able to have a film that's like explicitly queer in nature. And it got a lot of media publicity well before it was out. So I, I, I don't know the answer, but I'm curious how many people already knew it was a queer film in India and chose not to go to it because it didn't do well in the box office, right? Like, like let's, let's be honest about that. It didn't do well in the box office, whereas normally a mainstream Bollywood romance like this has an audience and it, it does fairly well. Um, so it's, it's, I have this curiosity of what it looks like to actually like 
do the subversion of queerness. And we, we do start seeing more and more queer characters in films. And for me, I think a Bollywood that's moving or a Hindi language cinema that's moving towards like accepting and seeing queerness is when we can see characters that are positive in films. And not just the like continuous, like look, we're queer positive because we have that really effeminate man who's the sidekick, right? We, we see that play out again and again in Bollywood film. And, and for me, I'm like, even right now when I think about North American film or North American TV, what are the ones that I go towards are the ones where queerness just happens to be part of the character's identity and it's not the centerpiece and it's not the joke and it's not the piece. And so I think Bollywood will get there, but I do think they have a long way to go because they've, they've made a livelihood out of making queer and trans characters the joke in their spaces, and then saying that, look, we're queer positive because we have that effeminate gay man, or because Dostana happened, clearly it's positive. Right? I was gonna add to that too, like when you, if we look at, say when Fire came out, um, and how at the time cinemas were literally burned down, um, and now we're, and then, you know, then there's Dostana, which again was basically making fun of uh, queerness. Um, so in that way, you can look at this film and think, okay, you know what, we've sort of come a long way. But on the other hand, I wonder, um, so the director specifically said, you know what, I'm actually trying to reach the audience that's not uh, reached yet. I'm not trying to reach the urban city audience. I'm trying to reach the Moga audience or the Patiala audience or the small sort of town audience. But I don't know if that actually was successful or not, the formula, because it didn't do well in the box office. So um, I don't even know if like a film is gonna transform people in, in that sense. Um, but so you wonder, okay, so in many ways it was toned down to reach that audience, but I don't know if the audience even would have gone to the cinema to watch the movie, so. Um, I will add that it got added to Netflix very quickly. Um, I don't know well. if anyone knows if it's on Netflix in India. It is amazing. Um, and I was listening to a podcast with Sh Shelly Chopra Dhar, who was talking about the intentionality of the film. And one of the things she said really resonated with me, which was that a lot of the people who might be interested in viewing this film are in the closet, is the way she framed it, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and that she's hoping that with the Netflix release and the interest is that there might still be folks that would not go to an audience to see it. And I'm really curious to see if, there'll be more people watching it and will it generate conversations in the coming months. And I've heard it's doing well on the Netflix yeah. global kind of front, yeah. Well, the one thing that's really different about this film versus every other film is it actually shows like people in a non-urban center. Every other one um, has been English speaking, urban centered. And so this is like a very different phenomenon. So I think We'll see how, I, I don't think you can measure it from box office, this this particular one, because there would be a lot of stigma probably to go to a film like this if you're closeted. So mm -hmm. I think we'll see, we'll see ripple effects later. Mm -hmm. My next question is for Amita. Um, you've spent decades um, claiming um, Indian mu music for queer people. What did you think of the soundtrack for this film? Was it a lot of, a lot of um, references to older songs and, yeah, I, 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 I mean, they definitely there was like three classic songs. So of course, Ek Larki Ko Deka, which I really love that song from that original movie, which they used again. And then there was the Malkit Singh's, um, uh, oh my God, I'm Gornal Ishk Mata, which of course is like a, a, a dance for a classic even today. So any version of that song will make people dance. And then there was Long Longavacha too. So I think they're all um, uh, they're all beautiful songs. They're timeless songs, and I think they were sort of chosen purposely to sort of engage that mainstream Punjabi audience. Yeah. And can you speak more to reclaiming songs because that's been a huge part of the movement as well. And you've been doing that mm -hmm. like independently here yeah, yeah. <laughs> for for decades. So. Um, just what what the role of music is within the queer community, especially mainstream music. Well, I think kind of what you were speaking about before, like there's a lot of songs that might have been written, like say for the male gaze of women, or but then within the queer context, people sort of uh, reclaim those songs and make it uh, infuse it with their own meaning. Um, so I mean, there's so many classical songs or um, 
uh, mudra song. There's just so many songs that I think when uh, on the queer dance floor, um, first of all, everybody you know wants to be that Bollywood actress, so it brings that actress out and and all the the queer folk. Um, but uh, and and just the animation and um, the majesticness of it all. So I think um, for that. It's pretty incredible, and, and Bollywood cinema is full of that, obviously, that kind of fantasy and that um, over-the-top exaggeration. of, um, And I think that, and that's what I find people love on the dance floor, so queer folk really kind of being able to bring out that part of themselves and in a space where there's some kind of safety. Um, and you know, and sometimes that's accomplished, and sometimes it's not. Like uh, even in in Toronto, like in Bayshore, we've struggled so much. Uh, and, and 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 you know, sometimes I feel like I've lost the battle there. Uh, but there's been a lot of uh, spaces where um, people have you know also taken over and tried to create those spaces as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, within within um, the queer azadi marches, we don't call pride pride in India. We call it a queer azadi generally. Um, there's always like the latest item song is being sung, or um, there's you know there's the classics biad kia to darna kia and um, bavra man is is another one. So it's popular music plays a big part within within those spaces, which you don't find as much here. Like here, there's there's the this, this separation between the dance floor and and the marches um but there there's like uh, people sing it people sing people dance in in a very different way um my next question is for Becca. Uh, for the past 20 years the bulk of queer artistic production has been pedagogical in nature especially south asian um, many works are about convincing the family to love and accept um, queer people do you think that this pedagogical film, Eklerki, um, has the same effect here in the diaspora? Yeah, thanks for that question, Indu. Um, you, you told me this question before I started the film, and I was like, this is going to be my response. And then I saw the film and got all emotional. Um, <laughs> um, I will say, I do want to say that, I mean, uh, your party in Space Room was one of the first parties I went to after being queer and had a blast. I was like, oh my god, she's the best DJ ever. Um, so yeah, Amita's been doing this work for a long time because I'm not young. <laughs> um, I think the answer, I, I don't think I have a succinct answer for your question. Because, um, you know, I saw it with a bunch of diasporic folks and I also saw it with folks who are not um, born here when we saw the film. And, and like I said, all of us were like, I don't know if that did it for me. I don't know if like that's really the message that's going to get me somewhere. Um, and And we knew that like, we could like theoretically in our heads be like, we know this film was made for an audience that is not us. Like I want, like as much as I wanted to see a queer romance on screen, I knew that was not the intent of it. And so I think about diaspora communities and I had conversations with my friends in queer South Asian communities uh, to be like, what does this film mean to you? Did your parents see it? Did you so? And to be honest, most of the folks I talked to, they're like, my parents have not seen it. They go see every Bollywood film. They didn't go see this one. Or folks being like, it's not even on their radar. I even put it on their radar. And so it's been a hard conversation with diaspora communities, to be honest. Because um, for most of us, I don't think that the film has done anything in terms of our relationships to family. And, and I'm sure there's people who have a different experience. And this is me not speaking for every South Asian diasporic person. Um, but we also, like, I know I recognize the impact this film has on my friends that are newcomers, for my friends who do have families back home and what it means for them. Because I think for someone who's been a patron of the arts in Toronto for like 15 years almost, I get to see amazing queer South Asian representation in this city, right? And, and Bilal, because you came so late, I'll do a shout out for you because you came just for me. Like my friend Bilal, who did their play last year at Chabacha, if anyone saw it, or has it been, no, it's been a year. Um, or is now doing another play this Saturday, like, like I've gotten to see good queer South Asian representation in theater, in film, and I think a lot of diasporic South Asians who are connected to queer communities get to see that here every day, um, on the regular, maybe not every week, but every few years. I feel like that has a larger impact on our narratives with our families and our communities. Like, 
just a couple of months ago in Mississauga, we got to see a play that's very similar to this, actually. Uh, Satish Wet Savita. Some of you might have been familiar with it. Uh, Savitri Productions. Savitri? Yeah. Um, and they, they staged it a second time because it was good enough and popular enough that the city of Mississauga funded it. And it was exactly kind of a similar construct where they're make, setting up a wedding setting. And then at the intermission, they like the big reveal is that it's two girls who want to get married, right? Um, and so I think about the impact of something like that, which like a lot of straight people, a lot of aunties and uncles in Mississauga went and saw. And I think that'll have a larger footprint than I don't know if this film will. So I don't know, I find that the diaspora has a disconnect in my experience with Bollywood and Hindi film because they see it as this like thing that's floaty up here. Like it's fun to watch. We want to watch it every day. My family also will watch every single film that comes out. Um, but I don't think that they connect it to their lives. At least that's been my experience and for a lot of my friends. And so, yeah, I don't know what the impact of it is on diasporic, like for second generation kids in the city. I, I think our conversations earlier around representation for ourselves and being able to know that there is room for us now or that room is being made and decriminalization we know has an impact and has some a meaning to us as well here. Um, I think that's the piece that is probably more meaningful than the movement of familial relationships. I was just gonna add to as like someone through Basham that attempts to straddle both the sort of straight and queer communities um, and sort of have them come into one space. I, I mean, and like sometimes, you know, it's queer positive and we're able to accomplish that and other times it's not. But I'm very aware that um, like the, the like this film actually also touches on so many other things like the cultural expectations, um, the, the patriarchal sort of um, context of where a lot of, uh, you know, women have to, I guess, endure some of those uh, familial expectations. And um, and I think that in some ways tries to say, hey, you know what, like whether you want the, the father trying to be a chef and that's not expected or um, the uh, Juhi Chawla character who is kind of like this middle-aged woman, but she's sort of giving, she in a way occupies this alternative narrative because she's independent and she's the one who's kind of progressive, right? Uh, that's kind of trying to tell the father, hey, um, you know, and, and to try to confront the father and his Islamophobia and things like that. Um, so I think that like there's so much regulation um, of, of people's lives within that context uh, and women's lives. And I think the, the, the so-called protective brother, which um, a lot of Punjabi families have, which are really just the abusive brother. But I mean, there's just there's so much of this that just becomes normalized. And I think that the the film is trying to touch on so many different aspects. Um, and I know that through Basher, I'm like, I see that the, the homophobia, the transphobia, the sexual harassment, it's, it is very alive and well in a lot of the our communities and uh, constantly uh, we need to fight it because it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunately very alive and well. Um, shall we open it up to the audience? Sure. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I see one back there. I'll just repeat the question for folks in the back because the mic wasn't working. Um, the question was, do you think only a queer trans person could make this film or that required that eye? Uh, sure, I'll answer it. Uh, I, you know, I have complex feelings about uh, non-queer people being in acting roles in the film, but I can understand the importance and the role that they play to give it a larger stage. I do think having a writer and director that understood the topic, like Shelley Chopradar's like son is gay. Um, I think the nuances of the ways and the delicateness where the film handles the material, because you can see it, you can see the films and for queer folks in the audience, you can notice it, whether it's the girl at the end in the audience and you're like, that's the gay one that they're portraying, right? Or, or the really excited like man at the end, like 
those little delicate moments, I don't think would have been as seamless and as well done. And also the chemistry between the women, if it wasn't directed or written by someone who understood the community. Yeah, I think I agree. I think that there's more, there's an authenticity to it uh, that probably like would not be there. And unfortunately, we'd probably get another sort of male gaze on the whole, um, you know, the that kind of gaze and the way that story is told, especially uh, to women. So I, I, I agree that there's. I think it should be. I, I, I think it definitely has to should involve um, like either. Um, partnering or like some connection, allyship with queer community to produce the film. Um, yeah, I mean, as as uh, Iman mentioned, uh, Ghazal Daliwal, the writer of this film is a trans woman and she's Punjabi. And I feel like a lot of the f work is not I mean, it's, so much of it's about sexuality, but so much of it's also about, you know, how it's depicting these family men, right? And like um, the lived experience of, you know, girlhood um, and like coming into womanhood and growing as growing up as a Sikh girl in the small town. So, I mean, it's not just the specificity of the queerness of the transness, but also the fact that it in some ways is respecting the geography, the context, um, and uh, yeah, in many ways, like commenting on the ways in which, you know, these the family functions, right? Um, and the ways in which uh, the family sustains itself, um, at whose cost, right? At, at so often at the, at the cost of the daughters. So, um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that answers your questions at all, question at all. Thanks. I think I would add something to what Aditya said. It deals with girlhood, but it also deals with toxic masculinity and the imposition of toxic masculinity and the brother characters abusiveness I also read as a as him being closeted you know there's that scene in which um there's the gay boy and in which he is um fondling him you know and to me there, there's there's other subtexts that are in there <laughs> even the you know just even the image of the diary and her and her like um her illustrations um really like that memory of her her witnessing um, that, you know, violence happening onto that boy, mm -hmm. like that's kind of etched in her mind. Mm -hmm. She's like, she's painted it, she remembers it, she narrates it in the Gurdwara. There's something so intimately linked to like, b when it comes to like her queerness and her sense of loneliness, or even her sense of being suicidal uh, with what happened in school, with what not just what happened to her, but, but with what happened to that boy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Hello. Um, I just have a comment um, rather than a question. Um, but I went to see this movie in theaters when it came out on the opening weekend. Um, I'm a huge Bollywood fan. I took a break for it from a very long time. Um, but in high school, I grew up in Mississauga. So naturally, I was surrounded by all Indians um, or many Indians um, and came to start watching Bollywood. And then for about maybe eight, maybe I'd say 10 years, I took a break from Bollywood. And then last year, I went to India and, you know, I was like, oh, I need to get back into this. And so I started watching. And when I saw this trailer for this film, it was during the during the winter holidays. And I was just like, OK, like this is this is a first in terms of mainstream. Um, and I went to go see it in theaters on the opening weekend. And what I thought was really powerful about it, even though, you know, it may not be changing the narrative, like, you know, having this major, major impact from a diaspora perspective. But when I went to the theaters on that opening weekend, there were families as they would normally go to watch a Bollywood movie. You have grandparents all the way down to children who are five years old who were in the theater. Everybody, yes, they did gasp, but they were all they all stayed and they watched the film all the way through. Um, and I'm of Nigerian descent and we have Nollywood. <laughs> um, but. I always tell my friends who are Indian that Nigerians and Indians are quite similar in terms of the things that 
Nigerian, you know, the culture places value on and the way the patriarch is very strong and what women should do, what men should do. And, you know, in Nigeria right now, being queer is essentially a criminal act. Um, and so we haven't even got to the point where it has become decriminalized. And I, I remember when I finished watching this movie being like, I wish this movie was also playing in Nigeria. There was like a Nigerian version of this because it touched not only on queer, but it touched on Islamophobia. It touched on bullying. It touched on what the role of men and women should be. And these are conversation pieces that need to be happening in Nigeria as well or within the Nigerian community that don't happen simply because it's just things that we don't talk about. Um, so I think overall what I'm trying to say is that I think you know, when people say representation matters, it matters in many, in various forms, because I know that if there was a Nigerian version of this that was mainstream, you know, some of my friends who are queer and have basically had to uproot their entire lives from being outside of, Ni leaving Nigeria essentially to live what is almost like an alternate life, because if you do this in Nigeria, you may not be alive. Uh, so I think there's always, you know, always the remembrance of the importance of representation and hopefully, you know, this opens a door with having Anil Kapoor, Sonam Kapoor, a big studio backing this, it being a mainstream film, will open the door for more content um, and hopefully more conversations. So India should be happy that this uh, came out because Nigeria and other cultures around the world would definitely benefit from having something like this too. So there's a... I think there's a huge gap between something being decriminalized and it actually being accepted, especially in a, in a place like India or many parts of South Asia. So, A, I'm, I'm curious as to, like, how has India responded to the decriminalization? And B, how if, if there's any knowledge of, like, how the filmmaker decided to make this film in this moment, uh, roughly a year, I would say it probably probably took longer and probably started being made earlier than the court passing the ruling. But I, I'm just curious as to both of those aspects. So um, we knew the court date was coming up for the last two years. Um, it, it was quite clear and like there was a lot of strategy. So I, because the case has been long pending, um, just in a nutshell, uh, the Delhi High Court decriminalized, and then the Supreme Court a, a couple of years later um, wrote down that that reading and that um, which was a very strong judgment. It's it's the best judgment on decriminalization probably in the world. It is it's based in human rights. It's based on uh, in a very it's based in a very different set of language than any other. Um, any other court case around decriminalization. After that, the Supreme Court wrote down that reading uh, when it was challenged by um, every religious group in the country. Um, and so there was strategically just, um, there, there was a loophole in that usually you can't actually, you could do a judicial review and there, they found, th we found a loophole in that. But basically what, People knew this decision was going to come. There was a lot of hope that it was going to be positive. Um, the the bench that presided over this case was positive. So I think there was just like people were waiting with bated breath to just for the decision to come down. And I think for the film for something like this to be made. So while it takes a long time, um, the movement has been working for t oh, about twenty years, and and there's been various elements that have been kind of pushing that along. So. In terms of things on the ground, um, I have done support work on the ground, um, not since decriminalization, but a few years prior. And, you know, you would be quite surprised at the kinds of things that are happening. Um, people are emboldened because the way that the movement has been organizing was like to write in uh, regional lang language newspapers and to write like ver very, very, um, like personalized stories. And I, I, I was a columnist for the New Indian Express for a few years. And every time I wrote a piece that was personal, I would get a flood of emails from uh, around the world, you know? And so I think that there, there was, there's been a lot of 
on the ground representation. And that was always the strategy within the movement to have various levels of representation. And like, we weren't really relying on Bollywood. We knew Bollywood would once at some point jump on the bandwagon, but you know, there's been lots of other productions made and people, there's a, a companion piece to this film would be uh, a film called Ye Freedom Life, which is made by an experimental filmmaker, which actually gives a very different story. It's about working class um, a, a trans community as well as um, a femme community operating in out in the open in De- in Delhi. Um, in, and it just takes this one neighborhood and it looks at how people negotiate their lives, their queer lives. And it's not easy, but it's also not as hard as you would imagine. And so I think these we can't. There's no one blanket brushstroke that we can use to be like queer, queer lives are easy or hard. People are in it, and they're dealing with whatever they're dealing with. The caseworks that I was working on were all. I was working in Bombay, and people were always in butch femme couples running away from their small towns and trying to establish themselves in the big city. And that was, there's many reports. Um, I was working with an organization called Labia, Lesbians and Bisexuals in Action. (laughs) Um, And that, that was like all of the casework that we did. And many reports have been actually come, have come out since then about that, those kinds of migrations that are happening of queer people to cities. So um, I hope that answers at least part of your question. And maybe there's other people on the panel that can speak to it. Um, yeah, I, thanks for your point earlier that like decriminalization doesn't mean, um, and you know, we know that in Toronto, we know that in Canada, right? That even post decriminalization for a good decade or two after the police were still targeting us at bathhouses, we were still being attacked. And like, I would even argue till present day we're being attacked. Right. So, um, I think some of it is like from a Western construct for us to like really decolonize and rethink like what the framework is. Cause whether decriminalization came a year ago or not, like it's not like this has been like a very, very, very long fight in India, right? Um, and you, you know, there's tons of prides in film festivals, and I would say that the queer and trans community in India is so vibrant. And like, I'm not even someone who spent time in India, and I get to see it even online. Like, I just today was like the film festival in Bombay, the queer film festival, is celebrating 10 years this year. Right, which is huge when you think about it. And so it's, sometimes it's about like deconstructing this concept of does decriminalization equal a vibrant queer life? Because queer life is so vibrant in India and trans rights are just like, I would argue in some ways even ahead of us in the ways that they think about trans people. And so, yeah, like just to add to that, that it's like the organizing on the ground and people living their lives has existed regardless. Just to add to that, um, there's, um, it's, it's it's like celebratory, but it's kind of a worrying time as well because um, there is a huge risk and it's already ongoing. It's not like it's a risk, but um, there um, is very there there isn't like an ample threat of uh, the queer mo- the queer movement or queer celebration uh, not only being co opted by like you know the Hindu right wing um, kind of um, uh, rhetoric, but also in many ways, it's very much part of it um, in some ways. So you'll see a lot of like wealthy elite queers um, who perhaps also, you know, continue to support um, really awful things that are ongoing. I mean, um, at this moment, um, the transgender rights bill, um, as well as um, there's an anti-sex trafficking bill, uh, they're both really harmful um, and um, really um, uh, violent legislations that are in process uh, that are supported by these big um, kind of uh, that are supported by the polity, right? So um, yeah, and they're particularly harmful to trans women, to hijras, to sex workers. Um, and meanwhile, we also have the sentiment of rainbow pride and like this kind of like, oh my god, like decriminalization. This is the new headline, but really, it's ecl- eclipsing a lot of you know minor violences that are. Uh, really terrifying, actually, as well. Yeah. Right, and and we have seen the saffronization, like the yes. uh, of of the queer movement, and that's something that is of concern. And those conversations have been ongoing for many, many years, for the last 10 years of, of right-wing forces kind of infiltrating the queer movement, but not just white right-wing um, forces, but also corporations. Like, we had kept our prides unfunded for many, many years, and, you know, uh, I remember one year I was organizing the Azadi March in Bombay, and um, Google, and um, the World Bank of Scotland, and a whole bunch of other banks 
just infiltrated the march with with their uh, branding and trying to and well and it was a very big fight between gay men and lesbians um to actually like the lesbians being like we will not take any corporate money we will not be what you know whitewashed in this way we want azadi as azadi and um a lot of the gay men actually arguing for a very different version which is much more of a western contemporary western version of pride yeah which is why i think like just seeing you know the seeing the gurdwara like seeing the photo of gurnanak in this film like just seeing these very traditional markers that we would associate with you know conservatism um is is such a freeing thing in this film yeah mm -hmm. i have one last question over here sure The actual love story. <laughs> <laughs> that thirty-second montage in Delhi, but wasn't enough. Two hours, yes. I want them to break up and have an actual other romance. It can't be that like the first gay drama. person she ever meets she is the person drama. she falls in love I know with. That. <laughs> I, I think we're we're done for our time. Is that right? Yeah. Thank I, I want to thank my esteemed panelists. Thank you very much.